Uh, open up the um, Board of School Directors uh, meeting on May 31st for the Montpelier Roxbury uh, School Board. Uh, a couple quick announcements at the beginning. Um, one Libby is juggling some family stuff, so she's unable to be here, although she did say she's on call, but um, I think we can hopefully avoid having to, to call her. Um, Anna, unfortunately, was not able to get into the C-13 um, document on homeless students, so uh, sh I don't think any board member has that, so we, w we can kick the reading on that back another meeting. Um, that's the, the policy monitoring? No, or is that's it a new students oh, homeless. I mean, we draft. can have the reading if you want to send it around right now to everyone and... Um, yeah, I made it um, accessible to all to view, so I don't know if the link... Let me just check the link on the... Oh, oh it wasn't put on to the... Yeah, and Anna I just sent me an email before huh. this saying she was not able to get a copy. Okay, yeah, let me... I'll send it. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing I want to state is that this is Barrick and Zach's uh, last meeting as student representatives. They will be graduates of Montpelier High School by the time we meet next. Uh, so I just want to congratulate them on that and thank them for their service. Uh, it was great to have both of them serve. They, they served very thoughtfully and really contributed to a lot of important discussions over the year and, and brought some great perspectives to the board and, and uh, really helped connect us, I think, with student concerns. And uh, um, it was also just great to, after COVID to get students back on the board. We had a little hiatus. And uh, American Zach, I think, uh, brought, it, brought it back uh, robustly. And uh, again, uh, thank you very much. And there will be and we'll get in touch with you with some small parting gifts uh, as a thank you. But uh, again, thanks for, for all you've done. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, and, <laughs> and of course, you are, you are always, always um, invited to, uh, to come to board meetings when, whenever you want to, and I'm sure that uh, Miriam and Alara, who we're excited to have on for next time, um, uh, will appreciate your offer to, to be able to reach out to, um, to them with questions. Um, uh, so uh, public comment is next. Uh, you know, public comment is an opportunity for the public to give feedback to the board. Uh, it's a listening uh, session only for the board, uh, but it's, it's very important even though we don't respond in real time. Uh, we uh, certainly take into consideration. We, we try to, to um, research and find out about problems and issues that are, are brought to us and uh, certainly, uh, you know, if there are direct problems we try to, that we can address, we try to address them. Uh, and they certainly inform our thinking about priorities and needs in the district. Uh, so it's very important even if uh, we are not actively engaging with you at the time. And we also acknowledge that, um, you know, that the issues that come to us before are very important and uh, that speaking before a board can feel intimidating even though we're, we, we, we're not a terribly intimidating bunch. So I uh, appreciate um, Appreciate uh, all of all of the the public discussion. So we have a few people uh, in the audience. I don't know if anyone is here for public comment. If so, please go ahead and um, and come up to the desk and introduce yourself. Otherwise, we'll see if there's anyone on the uh, virtual um, screen who is interested in public comment. No in the room. Anyone online? And please, you can either raise your hand. Uh, with the raise hand function in reactions, or you can come off camera and, and wave at us and we'll, we'll see you. All right, no public comment, thank you. Um, so next on to the consent agenda, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So move. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion about any items on the consent agenda? 
Yeah. I just wanted to note that the two board retreats, the one on the 14th of July and the one on the 10th of August, I believe, they're not at 6.30 to 8.30. So, Anna, could you um, make a note that those are from 8 a.m. to noon um, when we finalize it or, you know, so once it's like up on the website? Um, and then just a reminder for board members and then also members of the public that our next meeting, the one on June 14th, is the last evening board meeting until we meet again in the evenings on August 16th. So we'll have those two retreats in between there, but no other evening meetings as a whole board. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And thank you for noticing the, the, the times. Um, any other comments? Uh, do we need to... Make a vote. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, do we need to, to amend the thing to approve the consent agenda with the changes to the times? I no. don't think so. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Um, board learning focus. Uh, so student presentation on MSMS sustainability. It looks like we've got some students here. So uh, take, please come up and, and take it away. We're really excited. And if you need any, any technology assistance, um, Hi, Merrick. Hey. Um, where were, what's the best? We have a presentation that we're going to Whatever is best for you. If you guys want to sit down and do it, if you want to um, do it standing up. Uh, what's best? What do you guys want to do? I'm going to log into the meeting now. I'd rather stand yeah, up. Yeah, so and I, I, think, stand up. I think Anna looks like she's on it in terms of getting the presentation. Do you want it? We're on the screen. I'm doing that. Sure. I'm good with whatever. Okay. Mommy, where are we going? We'll just sit around here if that's okay. So good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for having us. My name is Don Taylor, and I teach uh, sustainability at Main Street Middle School. And our program is called uh, MSMS Sustain. And one of our missions is to uh, communicate what we're doing on a regular basis. Uh, so this is our first time at the uh, school board, and we appreciate uh, your listening. Uh, we do have some students. Uh, we also have our program assistant, Drew McNaughton, and uh, I'm just going to let each of them uh, introduce themselves before we get going here. Drew? Oh, Drew McNaughton. I'm the enrichment coordinator here at Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. And um, over the last couple of years, I've been watching the growth of uh, the sustainability program and wanted to find a way to um, get my hands into it. And luckily, last year, I was able to get uh, take on a role within the program. And this year, embed myself further into the program uh, during the school day while maintaining the after school programming that I do um, as well. And um, it's been a pretty amazing experience. Hi, my name is Oborji. I'm an eighth grader at MSMS. My name is Audrey Childs. I'm also an eighth grader. MSMS. My name is Adele Pritchard. I am also an eighth grader at MSMS. Uh, so again, thank you very much for having us. Um, so this story kind of started three years ago uh, in the January, I think, of 2021 when we were in our pod year. Uh, our eighth graders and Merrick have all been deeply impacted by the pandemic, and uh, they were looking for a hands-on learning opportunity. I had done some environmental work in my humanities class, and that led to the creation of this program. So uh, if you look up on the slide, our mission uh, statement, this was created by our youth partners, is to work together to create youth adult partnerships, educating the community within a diverse and positive learning space. We strive to resolve social, economic, and environmental issues. Next, please. Good. So in year one, uh, what we did is I signed up with uh, Shelburne Farms. Uh, they have a program called Cultivating Pathways to Sustainability. And uh, I also started working with Up for Learning. Up for Learning emphasizes um, the growth of youth partnerships, where you're building partnerships and relationships with students, uh, and they're accepting more responsibility, and they're transitioning into leaders, not only in your classroom, but in the school community. So our mission was to create an engaging sustainability program at school for students to learn, educate others about sustainability-related issues, and to make a difference in our community by using voice, skills, and vision. And one of the uh, impetuses behind this program was that students were coming out of these pods, they were coming out of the pandemic, 
and they really wanted some engaging hands-on learning. Next, please. So uh, year, that was year one. That was from January to June, I think, of 2021. 2021, 2022 was our first full year as a program. Next slide, please. Uh, so we had a steering committee in 2021-22, so we had six to ten kids who were interested in the program. We met once a week, and uh, they had gone through the Cultivating Pathways to Sustainability program with me. They were giving us input and advice about the direction of the program, and out of that came our, we have a leadership uh, group. All three of these students are on that leadership group. And now that leadership and the leadership group have taken on a more important role in uh, driving and helping uh, build our programming and giving us a uh, youth partner voice and input throughout the year. Next slide, please. So this is our first, our, sorry, our second full year. Next slide, please. And Just really appreciating the alligator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Gators. So uh, what we did is uh, we created a framework for learning. And the framework is pretty simple. It's to educate kids uh, about sustainability issues in the school, in the classroom. It's to act on what we learn by connecting with local and community organizations. And then, as I mentioned at the uh, outset, it's to communicate what we're doing both to uh, the community, to the school, and uh, to our partners to show what we're doing in the hopes of creating a sustainability movement, which we hope will uh, confront social justice issues, issues of climate change, and issues of equity that occur uh, throughout uh, our communities, our state, and our nation. Next slide, please. So to do that, uh, this is kind of teacher speak, uh, the education piece, the foundations, that we teach kids about, we teach them about sustainability. We use the UN SDGs as a framework for learning. We talk about expectations. We review concepts, definitions. Uh, we're using a lot of personalized learning and the uh, personal learning plan so that kids can capture their growth. We look at climate change issues and down in the bottom right corner you see the three spheres of sustainability, which is a key component of our program. Those uh, spheres are uh, economics, environment, and equity. And so we try and look at uh, our projects through those lenses so that we can ensure that we're hitting all of those and making sure our students understand how those relate to the key concepts. Next slide, please. So again, uh, working together really to solve climate change. When I first started teaching the sustainability, we were looking at climate change, and it's really a doom and gloom story. It's hard to get around the data. It's hard to get kids enthusiastic when you're really overwhelmed by the data, which, um, you know, the facts are there, and uh, it's really unsettling. And so what we're trying to do is take a more positive outlook, see what we can do, how we can take action. And you see these are just some examples. Uh, create less waste, buy local seasonal foods, volunteer, and make our voices heard. Those things we can do. Next, please. And really what we're doing is trying to create a sustainability movement. So we're not fighting climate change, we're not, you know, I don't like that aggressive language. What we're trying to do is come together and build a sustainability movement uh, in our classroom that will give these kids the leadership skills and the understanding so that they can move out into uh, their life and their world and make a difference. Next slide, please. Our school use, uh, our sustainability program uses uh, project-based learning to make the sustainability class more engaging and to enhance our students' learning. Some of the projects that we do are um, cooking for the community. We bake a lot of bread um, through King Arthur uh, Baking Company, and we make a lot of different foods, um, some of which we get our food from, like food that's going to be composted from the kitchens that wasn't used, or food that we got from local farms or local orchards, and we take it and in our sustainability classes, the kids learn how to make different kinds of foods and learn different skills in the kitchens. And we also donate a lot of that food to um, Just Basics, the local food pantry, and to other uh, food shelters and food pantries. And we have also, in the bottom left corner, there's a picture of students tapping trees um, in, on the edge of Hubbard Park. And we also have 
started a community garden at our school and with another community partner has let us use some of their land to start a garden that we also use in some of our cooking. Next slide, please. So yeah, cooking for the community, our students in the class do a lot of cooking and we get food through gleaning and through um, different farms and orchards and we prepare it into different kinds of meals and we package it up and take it to just basics or to other like food pantries or food shops. Next slide. Yeah, and this helps us trying to um, reduce food insecurities. Next. Okay, um, this is some of our um, donation and volunteer work. We, um, we volunteer at Just Basics and at other um, places in our town that um, are community buildings. And um, we, as Adele was talking about, we donate most of the food we make to, um, to our volunteering places. And at Just Basics, um, there is other like personal care items and um, things that someone might need. You can go to the next slide. Um, we have had a fiber arts unit throughout our grades, um, and we work with a community partner, Kate Camiletti, to, um, who has helped us learn about these, um, like darning and mending wool and um, out of favor clothing items that, was, that were donated through um, the community to our school. And we used a wool drive that um, I and one of um, my fellow peers put on to give back and, um, and repair items for the community. Can you go ahead. And this is all to help with fast fashion and reduce um, the waste from clothing. So we have a maple sugaring program at the middle school. So sometimes in your classes, when it's your turn to have the sustainability class, um, through a community partner, we have some maple trees that are adjacent to Upward Park. So we'll hike up there and we'll tap the trees. And so using that maple syrup and sap, we gathered about 15 gallons total of syrup this year, not sap. Um, nice. And we boil all the sap down and then we package it up. And so our labeling committee made these really fun labels. And so we'll label all the bottles. And then we have this online store where we'll sell maple syrup. And so um, a third of the proceeds go to the food pantry, Just Basics, that Adele was talking about earlier. A third goes into MRPS Pie to help support um, our community here at MRPS. And then another third goes back into our program to make sure that we can keep on doing things like this in the future. Next slide, please. Yeah, and so this helps with climate because we are using natural and local resources to make our place better and sell things locally rather than get them imported from far away. And it helps with folk life because we are using community partners and accessing places in our community. Next slide, please. Um, uh, the community gardens piece, we put in six raised beds at the middle school, um, out, out behind the school, um, kind of behind the cafeteria. So there's six raised beds right in a row. Um, and those uh, we planted last year um, we put in pollinators on one end, we put in herbs, we put in veggies, um, and this year we're focusing on um, differentiating the beds down, and in future years what we want to do is thematic bed um, setups, so there'll be um, herbs and uh, savories and then uh, indigenous plants, and like so teaching gardens, um, and they've been really successful. and and untrammeled, which is incredible <laughs> at a middle school. And, um, and I think that's because student buy-in, because we try, all the kids are rotating through and, um, and have been incredible workhorses in that garden. We just put in potatoes today. Um, there's a bunch of onions and garlic. And last year, we actually had um, community partners, parents in the community. We made a little video about how to water the garden. And we said, oh, I, I hope we get sign-ups for this to happen. And within like an hour, 
all the slots were filled to, for the whole summer um, of parents signing up to, to volunteer, which is really great. And, and that led to another community partner um, volunteering some land that was mentioned earlier for us to go out and garden. So there, there are these, this triangle of backyard that's as big as the opening in these tables is now planted and weeded and mulched um, and it's going to be growing, you know, squash, corn, beans, um, and a bunch of other things for our program. And if it gets used in the kitchen to, to donate, that's great. Um, if kids get their hands dirty and learn how food grows and get connected to it, um, great. And, um, and the fact that they're going out and interfacing with the public in these ways pretty daily is, is pretty incredible. So, um, next one. So yeah, so pollinators, local agriculture. As I said, like we're, we we made some mason beehives in the woodshop last year when there was a woodshop at the middle school, and um, and we're going to you know continue uh, pushing pollinator species um, in all of our garden setups around the school and and kind of increasing uh, community awareness around pollinators. One idea was a pollinator pathway along the bike path um, and some other things have been mentioned. So um, can go ahead. I don't know if this next one's mine or not. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the other thing we do is phenology. So phenology is a study of seasonal change. And, and seasonal change <coughs> seems to be changing. Um, so seasons seem to be coming at different times um, than we're used to. So instead of just saying back when I was a kid, um, we're walking with students. We do community walks. And we, we take notes on what's happening in the environment around us. So we have uh, touchstone uh, species that we look at, uh, a certain tree, a certain patch of ground, a certain um, you know, section of the river. And, and we say, what are the changes that are happening here? What are the changes that are happening here? And kids get enculturated to it so that weekly, kids start to notice, oh, the lilacs are really like, they're really starting to leaf out, or there's, there's a bud burst, or um, I saw a flying insect for the first time um, this March. So, so those types of things, and, we're, and we notate that with students, so we'll have longitudinal data that they'll be part of, and they'll have like visceral response to um, that will indicate um, different seasonal changes. And, and to just note that that's how information is gathered. It's by people looking and seeing and understanding and touching and knowing. So um, that's, that's been good. And, and the sugaring operation also does that. Um, Mapping, the, mapping all the sugar bush. We have all the trees marked and mapped up in uh, Chris Hammer's land um, on Course Street. And, um, and in the future, we're going to get the aspect of where we tapped. Are we tapping the southwest side or the tapping the northwest side of the tree? And how much yield every time we go up um, is going is to give real data. And it'll give you know, quixotic data because sugar operations that are large scale don't quite understand it yet. So what are, you know, um, but I think just being a part of that process is, is going to be important. I think you can go ahead. So yeah, climate data, as, as I was indicating. Um, just the kids being connected to that data and not, not having it come from some nationalized source that, they, that they're disconnected from. Um, our leadership group has partnered with Up For Learning and specifically with uh, Katie Ingraham, I think I pronounced her last name right. And um, we have gone to, I think, three retreats so far this year with um, mostly the entire group of our like, SST group. And we got to learn about different leadership skills and um, we got to reflect on what work we do in our group and make plans, like learn how to make plans for future and um, our most recent one was with some newer students who we want to recruit in to our group for next year once most of our eighth graders leave because eighth graders are the majority of our group and they got to look at all of the different um, committees we have inside of our group that they could work on or they could come up with a completely new idea to work on because in our group we do a lot of like personalized learning so that if like there's something that you're really passionate about and you really want to work on you can work on that and there's like a ton of different groups that you can work on. I think we're going to talk about those a bit later. And so we have some kids who are working on developing a leadership whole like leadership curriculum for next year, and like different activities that we can do to give kids leadership planning, which are, which helps with 
public speaking and confidence when talking to big groups and lots of different skills in life that they will definitely use even if they don't actually know that they're using them. Next slide. Okay, so some of the things that we've done this year as a leadership group is that, so if you all were here in December and you remember going to the Unitarian Church around December 10th, there was the Solidarity Craft Fair. We helped support that and so we made a bunch of food that could be brought there and then sold for lunch, which was awesome. We also have done staff lunches, luncheons at the middle school. So if it was a professional development day, you could come down to the sustainability room and get a nice homemade lunch and all the teachers really seem to like it. Um, like Adele just said, we have done some leadership training and planning and developed a curriculum so that next year students can learn more about our skills. Um, we have also done a personal items drive and um, there was a food drive that ended yesterday. So hopefully we got some stuff for that. We can then go donate to the Good Samaritan Haven or Just Basics to make sure that people in our community can get help that they need. We have also done as part of outreach is quarterly newsletters. So every quarter students write articles and then we format them into an online newsletter. And so we should be saying our new and out here probably in about a week, if not less. And so you can scroll through and click the articles and learn and read about what's happening in our classes. Next slide, please. Um, this is our seed to tree um, sort of metaphor for, um, for youth adult partnerships. And um, you can see the, the growth between um, how much uh, adults are helping our youth and our students in their community and through growth um, with the student, I guess, um, they can get to be um, full partners. You can see in this, um, in this uh, large tree, it's the youth and adult as full partners instead of youth adult as em emerging partners or youth as consultants and youth as recip recipients. So um, with this, it's sort of like your younger years, or honestly, us as well. The adults sometimes talk at us and not with us. So this is where we're reaching for in our community and in our sustainability and leadership group to um, bring a community together as partners instead of adults talking at us and not getting our opinions. So the MSMS Sustain 201 class started out as a course class and then our teacher had to leave partway through the year um, and we were going to just be put into a study hall but um, Mr. Taylor and Drew thought that we had like more potential for a study hall than just kids sitting around doing basically nothing and talking to their friends and they were right and so they took our class and converted it into our Sustain 201 class and we're kind of like an extension sustained class. So we meet just during our regular course times and we have worked on a ton of different projects. Like Opal touched on earlier, we had this uh, food drive that ended yesterday and we've done a bit of cooking and people have done separate projects. Some people organized a field day, I believe, for the end of the year. We organized a um, meeting with um, the with at the senior center in Montpelier where like good what seven kids maybe when more than seven I think it was around ten yeah. um, and we had a coffee and conversation with them so we joined them during their usual meeting time and with the help of um, Sarah Lipton we um, we got to share our knowledge and they got to share their knowledge and um, we talked about sustainability and how we could give back more to the community and do better even though we're we've tried to go so far and um and they really gave us some they enlightened us on their perspective of the community and what could be improved 
Yeah, it was definitely very interesting to see how things were then, how things were now, and how we hope them, how we hope for things to be in the future. It was interesting to see like the change between all of those things, and like to talk about the different opportunities that we have as um, like different ages living in different generations. It was very interesting, and I really enjoyed it. And we're going to try and continue it, maybe do one more this year, and then continue it next year as well, because it was a really fun program. So a lot of what you've heard about is the action where we've had kids uh, doing and with project-based learning, and none of this would be possible without our community partners. And uh, so Central Vermont Solid Waste Management, uh, they've been instrumental in helping us with a, re a reuse, recycle, a reduce, reuse, and recycle program for fifth graders. Uh, Up for Learning, as you just heard about, has coached us and coached me on developing a leadership curriculum and program where we're building uh, youth partners. And I'll thank them repeatedly, but our students here are our most important asset. And to hear them uh, be able to carry off these kind of presentations um, is fantastic. And they're sort of our most important voice. We've also uh, partnered with King Arthur. They have a Bake, Learn, and Share program. And then we've partnered with uh, Vermont Evaporator. And all these organizations uh, share um, our passion for, for good community work. And we also link the, we're not just baking bread, we're baking bread and we're donating Just Basics because there's a food insecurity issue in Vermont that's about to get a lot worse uh, in the next couple of months. Just Basics saw a doubling in the number of people visiting uh, their food pantry in 2022. Inflation, uh, job insecurity, uh, housing issues, those are all contributing to what we're seeing at the local level. And when we take kids over there to either volunteer or to drop off what we're, what we're making, those are all teaching moments. And we're reading, we're researching, we're writing about and reflecting on these things so that we understand how our actions are addressing uh, issues that are happening in the real world. Next slide, please. So uh, as you've probably heard, Just Basics has been instrumental. Uh, if you go to their website and read their mission statement, uh, they're a social justice organization and they've been absolutely fantastic. And uh, they've allowed us to bring our students over there. They're uh, looking at our products, they're giving us ideas, and we're taking those ideas and putting them into our curriculum. So one idea that I go back to a lot is, you know, we we're saying, oh, we're gonna make you know, this or that. And they said, you know what we really need is single serving meals that can be microwavable. Because mm -hmm. there's a ton of folks out there who don't have access to a kitchen and need something grab and go. So we decided, hey, let's start making burritos. So we, have, we got 170 pounds of butternut squash from the Beast Farm. We started making butternut black bean burritos. We have uh, lots of carrots that we're getting from Community Harvest of Central Vermont. So we're making carrot, bean, and rice burritos. We're packaging that up. We just delivered 105 burritos over the last two weeks to the Good Samaritan Haven. Uh, they're a new partner for us. Uh, and I drive that food right over there. And um, they've been very gracious about accepting that. And again, they have some serious issues with people who are struggling with big, big challenges. One of those, obviously, is getting enough to eat. And we're there to kind of to help them. And the kids know that. They learn about it. We've been to all these websites. We've learned all about their missions. And, and then the kids are able to kind of take it with the leadership and really make a difference. So I just also want to say about Community Harvest of Central Vermont, they're another fantastic organization. They focus on gleaning, recapturing food, they have a ton of uh, resources. They took us on a gleaning field trip where we made, I think we captured 2,100 pounds of apples. And they store it for us. And then if we need some of that, we can get it. Otherwise, they'll donate it and use that. So again, our kids were out there after the orchards at Vermont Technical College had closed down for the picking season. We went out there. We got a ton of apples. We took a tour of Vermont Technical College. We learned about their sustainability programs. So it's all connected. Right? It's that environment, equity, and economics. The other thing we've had, uh, we've worked with uh, Teens Reaching Youth and the Vermont um, UVM 4-H Extension Program for more than 10 years. And uh, we've, again, brought those into our program where we have kids learning about a specific climate or science issue and then going over to uh, Union Elementary School and teaching that another way of developing leadership skills Another way of seeing how kids, their own actions, can make a huge difference uh, in our in our very local community. And if I could just say something about that program, that Teens Reaching Youth program. Like when I, well, when we talk about 
um, that being a leadership module, uh, students come back from that and they say, okay, so what was going on in that back corner? Why weren't we engaging those students? Mm -hmm. They're talking about differentiated instruction. They're talking about such high level educational processes and tactics and new ideas that teachers don't think of because they're not close to their um, students in age the same way that these kids are. And it's 98% self-directed um, curriculum. So these students are getting a packaged curriculum, taking it and saying, oh, how are we gonna do this and modify this? And then they just have to go and do it. And, um, and they're getting over there, they're doing it, they're following a schedule, they're turning in documentation, they're turning in uh, you know, data um, on, this, on, on what they've been teaching and we're doing reflection on it. It's, it's, that's, it's a really amazing program. I think so. it creates a lot of empathy for us too, right. because they go and teach and they're like, man, that class went sideways. Yeah. And then we can say, see what I mean? And uh, you can see them in the classroom being like, oh, I get it now. So it, it also creates empathy. Next slide, please. So part of our outreach and communication, we have, as I talked about earlier, our quarterly newsletter, which you all can read our first three newsletters, which is up on our website. I think the fourth one got published today. It did? Actually. Yes. Okay, that's yeah, great. Tomorrow. Okay. Well, we're not there tomorrow, so it might not happen. Um, you can also check us out on Instagram. We have a whole page where we post videos of us cooking, um, us zoning, and like things that might be happening in the class or like updates on when you can read our newsletter or check out our new podcast episode where you can find us on YouTube. Don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> and so we post videos about our mission statement, some of our programs and like where you can find us. And hopefully next year there will be more about some issues in our community that people can help address and things that they can do at home to help spread awareness or be more of a help to the community. Next slide, please. So the um, yeah, so by the numbers, like when you look at like what have what have you really done? Um, so uh, every student in the school goes through um, a quarter of sustainability um, through our program, um, grades five through eight, um, and it's 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 a tough schedule a little bit because you know you just get rolling with these kids and they just get you know. Um, in the rhythm of things and then you get a whole new group, but you get to see all of them, which is great um, So we've done almost 600 meals um, and and we we packeted that number out based on it's over that now um, actually, but um, but based on like what would be a, a centerpiece aside um, and then some bread um, would be a meal, right? Um, and um, We've made again like Opal said we did 15 gallons of maple syrup um, We've had four leadership retreats, and those leadership retreats are um, Up for Learning comes in and partners with our students, and it's mostly student-directed uh, leadership retreats for their peers. Um, so it's leadership training from within that, like Don and I sit on the outside of or, or sit in as participants, as equal members, and it's really cool. Um, tons of apples, like we said. Um, that was one morning. Uh, and then they've done those, those drives. Um, and the, the difference with our program is that when we do drives, they're not gonna be a one-off. They're not gonna be a, oh, I did a, I, look, winter clothing, great, next thing. And we're gonna, it's, uh, it's gonna be ritualized so that they're, they're yearly activities. They become uh, cultural touch points. Um, they've created these newsletters. So we, we meet every single day with these, uh, with these students during their SST time um, and for half an hour. And they walk in the room, and the amount they accomplish in half an hour blows my mind every day. Um, and they sit right down, and they get to work. Um, and, and they come in with a mission. They come in with purpose. Um, and so when the newsletter's coming out, um, they're editing, they're peer reviewing, they're sending things around, they're prompting each other to, to get on top of it. Um, and they're embedding photographs and making these really uh, beautiful um, you know, informational pieces. Uh, the tri teams again they meet during that sst time as well and kids are coming and popping out of class so that they can go teach at union and they have to make up that work that they missed in that class mm -hmm. so they're doing it at this cost and i think that the benefit that they're they're you know gleaning from it is is just so intrinsic that it motivates um you know them to continue so um 
the, the new group that we have coming in, the new prospective uh, leadership committee uh, crew, is really excited about that TRI program. They, I mean, I think just from what they've heard other students talk about. And so, just in closing, I think it's really important, you look at these numbers, and what they're really doing is helping us set goals for next year. So that you heard, we have 21 new recruits coming in for our uh, leadership group for next year. And uh, that's in addition to the four classes that we run, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And when we have numbers like this, thanks to, these are our original members, our original leadership team members, and uh, our youth partners who have been with us from the start, we can say, this is where our program started. This is what we did last year. What are we going to accomplish this year? And that ability to set goals, to reflect on those goals, uh, allows us to sort of build out our program. And as we're building out our program, I'm starting to level up on what we're doing in terms of reading, in the communication skills, in uh, all the sort of academic uh, areas that kids are going to need to make sure that when they're going out to uh, teach other kids, they, they have the tools and that those tools will then transfer into leadership positions, connecting with the community, and eventually you'll see them here at the high school, uh, such as uh, Merrick, who's actually a former student of mine. Again, congratulations on your upcoming graduation. That's awesome. So we just want to thank you very much. We wanted to let you know what's happening in the classroom in our program. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let us know. Um, but thanks for all the work that you're doing, and thanks for having us this evening. And especially, I'd like to thank our students uh, for showing up tonight. That's a big, a big deal to me. Thank you very much. So thank you, that was awesome. This is really exciting work you're doing. Uh, and the presentation was fantastic. Uh, questions for uh, the students or Don or Drew? I, I have a, just like a kind of silly question for the students. Is this your favorite class? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, the I'm community that we've built in that class yeah. is just so amazing. We you get the in. most freedom and um, creative freedom, which I love because you can really work on what you want within boundaries, of course, but you can choose your interests and, and create a project out of that and really help your community and do something incredible. And it's not just the projects, it's also the people. We've built such like an amazing community. Everybody is not necessarily best friends with each other, but everybody's friendly with each other. Everybody is always helping each other out. You always know that like if everybody's working on something, there's always somebody who can pause what they're doing to help you with whatever you need. There's always like somebody there and there's always like people to talk to. It's always fun, it's always super light, but you're still getting a ton done. Mm -hmm. So definitely our favorite yeah. class. Mm -hmm. And it's not all just work, you're still, you get to socialize and, and of course there's like, sometimes after, after a class has came in and they've cooked, we go back and we clean and then we get the food they made, so <laughs> that's a plus. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, and I really agree with all that. And like today I was having like a kind of off day. I was like, woo, and then I came in and I was just like, okay, I'm safe, it's all good. And then I walked out and I held the rest of the great. I'm like, this, these are my people. Like, it's a home there. Mm -hmm. It gives you a reboot during the day because it's yeah. right in the middle. Right before lunch, too, so everybody's always a bit hangry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank Have you. Have a good evening, and if I don't see you, uh, enjoy your summer. Thanks for all your work. Thank you. Take care. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much for the presentation. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing your work with us. All right, excellent. Um, Thank you. Good night. So, Jess. Hey, Jess. Uh, <laughs> youth Adult Partnerships. Yeah, I get to follow that. What's yeah. <laughs> um, no big. I did try to have students here. I got a few takers, but then they had more exciting events <laughs> come up. So I apologize. I don't have students to talk about student um, adult partnerships. That certainly feels a little weird, but I'm excited for all of the wonderful events that those folks are doing tonight. All right. And also, I'm Jess Murray. Hi, everyone. I'm the Director of Social Emotional Learning and Wellness here at MRPS. There we go. 
So yeah, I'm gonna talk about youth adult partnerships. Um, I'll just put the caveat that this is sort of the more formal version of youth adult partnerships that are happening at MRPS. There, as we've just seen, so many different examples that are happening both informally and um, formally. So I just wanna recognize that I'm certainly not hitting all of them. Next, please. Um, so just some goals for tonight pre tonight's presentation. Um, I really want to share some actions of youth adult partnerships. Um, the ones that I'll focus on really focused on positive and safe climate for each and every student. Um, those partnerships were really excited and really dove into um, that lens of youth adult partnerships. So that'll be the primary focus for tonight. Um, and then of course, previewing next steps around what this will look like in the future and how we continue to grow these partnerships. Next please. Um, so as they were talking about, one of the main pillars um, is up for learning. They have been fantastic in starting and helping to grow youth adult partnerships. Um, Jackie is the person um, that this group works really hard with. Um, and so what that looks like at MSMS is folks meet with her on a regular basis with an adult partner. Um, and what they've done this year is they did a climate survey in October. They really wanted to focus on climate and what that looks like and how students were experiencing the middle school. They collected a bunch of quantitative data and then really wanted to dig in a little bit more around like what's the story behind that data, what students actually experience. So they went into TA um, and held discussions with kids and focus groups and really like dug into what is the student perspective and experience um, coming here every day to the building and being a gator. I also love the gators. Um, when they reviewed the data, there were really like three things that stood out of interest to them um, around student connections and how students feel connected to adults in the building. The second one, feelings of respect. Um, and they found some themes around student to student respect and teacher to student respect um, and want to dive in a little bit further to those and then how students feel like they have a voice in MSMS and what input they feel like they have into their school community. Based on those three areas that they really wanted to dive into, they started recently making an action plan and a brainstorm for next year so we can just get started um, at the beginning of the year. So one of the things that they really want to focus on is highlighting student strategies. They feel like you know, there are so many teachers who, as we know, right, are creating safe, positive learning environments in that space. So how can we amplify the strategies that they're using that are really working well for students in that building? Um, so how can we share teacher strategies that are working with other teachers to help them for their leverage? Um, and also, which I thought was really insightful, figuring out what is the administrator role in youth adult partnerships, right? I think that there needs to be this balance of um, respecting student space and student voice and as an administrator, as an authority figure coming into that space and how can you facilitate that work, make it easier for them and also not dominate that space. Um, so doing some work around that next year, I think is gonna be really important and powerful. Um, this year, they also work to recruit a wider representation um, of students in the building. So they have done a great job of recruiting some sixth graders and are really working to make sure that they can have fifth graders next year as well. Next, please, thank you. At MHS, they have worked pretty hard developing a mission statement, so really digging into the why behind their work, really what is the purpose of their sort of practice up for learning group at the high school. Um, they have really solidified around practicing conflict resolution and how to create a system of peer mediation and harm repair circles um, and thinking really deliberately about how do we infuse our sort of practices into the discipline system at MHS. Um, they visited another school just last week to look at what this looks like at another school um, and they've continued to develop some community building circles for TA. Um, 
And additionally, they really started to build up the work to push into MSMS. Unfortunately, we just like ran out of time at the end of the school year. They have created some great structures to um, visit MSMS at the end of you know the eighth graders years to help think about how do we welcome eighth graders into the MHS community um, in a way that feels like really intentional and good and so that they know what to expect when they get here. Um, some up for learning next steps is really thinking about how do we get started earlier in the year, especially at MSMS. Um, when I was talking to Jackie and some folks about their experiences this year, they felt like they spent a lot of time collecting data um, and would really like to think about, of course, data collection is important, and what do you do with that data collection and how you get into like action mode a little bit earlier as you're you know, helping to figure out what you want to do that year. Um, and again, clarifying the administrator role, how do we have that balance between adult facilitation and authentic student voice and authentic student partnership? Um, there at, at MHS, they're really interested in leveraging some community involvement. Um, the Community Justice um, Center is a spot that they are really interested in working with to again, think about how do we develop those restorative systems in MHS and how do we work on peer me mediated resolutions. Um, again, thinking about fifth graders and actually I happen to be there during this beautiful conversation with the uh, MHS students about you know, how they wanna work through peer mediation and how they wanna think about more about conflict re resolution, what that looks like, and then them realizing well, we don't actually have a lot of experience ourselves with this. So how do we tap into perspectives of people who are impacted, who are vulnerable to the discipline system? Um, and how do we get their voices so that we're not just like folks who haven't had that experience making decisions for other people? Um, and then of course, thinking about how do we align those two groups? They're doing very similar work um, and thinking about how do we create a pipeline of student leadership um, so that way we constantly have folks who are ready and want to engage in this work. Oh, next, sorry, thank you. Um, so something I am really excited to talk more about, and I'm sure some of you have heard about this, um, one of the other ways that Up for Learning helped facilitate some adult student partnerships was creating three half-day retreats um, to welcome some UES and all of the RVS fourth graders to transition into MSMS. Um, so we had one in March when it was still very, very wintry and cold and we were like huddled outside on a very icy playground, one in April and then one in May where it was beautiful and kids were yelling and having a great time and um, really just getting to know each other really well. It was co-facilitated and co-designed by MSMS students. Um, and we had all six Roxbury students come and we had six UES who were paired together and each of those paired had a MSMS ambassador. So it was a triad. Um, so that way we could form like an 18 person community and also they can create more personalized individual bonds um, with other folks. Next please. Oh, sorry. Just before we get this picture, sorry, do you mind going back? This picture on the right here is actually the last day we had at MSMS and the fourth graders decided to make a tunnel. Um, so it was a bunch of fourth graders making a tunnel for Julie Conrad, who if you know her, she's a pretty tall individual. So it was really just fun to watch her trying to navigate through this tunnel very skillfully, I might add. Um, but it was a really wonderful um, way to end our retreat time together. Thank you for going back for that. Um, so uh, during these three half days, we did a lot of community building. Um, we saw each other's schools. We had UES students and MSMS students actually go visit Roxbury. It was the first time I think all but one of them have been there. So that in itself was really powerful. They were able to see Roxbury, what it looks like, the town. Um, we also toured MSMS. We had student-led tours 
of MSMS, so middle schoolers toured with UES students while the Roxbury folks were meeting with Julie and the counselors, and then the UES folks helped to guide the Roxbury students. So it was sort of this tiered system where they could teach each other about the building and find all the gators that exist. They're plentiful there. Um, they also got to meet each other's principals and got to meet Julie. Um, they had some beautiful conversations around what is this transition going to look like, what are we excited about, what are we worried about, um, and it was just really wonderful to see the MSMS folks um, really lean into those conversations and help to, you know, knock away some of those unknowns and answer a lot of the questions that folks had. Um, and we ate lunch together, we ate snacks together, we had some fantastic chocolate chip muffins. Um, so that was really wonderful. In this work, we really dove into some of these questions around what values do we have as individuals? Um, based on those values, what type of community are we trying to build at MSMS? Um, and how do we want to feel every day when we're at MSMS? Like when we walk into that building, when we walk into our classroom, how do we want to feel on a day-to-day -day basis? And based on that, did a really nice job and they did a beautiful job, you know, as fourth graders doing this work, thinking about, so based on our values, what community we want, um, how we want to feel, what do we actually have to do on a day-to-day -day basis as individuals to build that community? And seeing that connection was just so powerful. Um, so that was our retreat. Oh, next please, thank you. Oh yeah, so, so this was one quote that we were lucky enough to have a caregiver share with us, just you know that difference between the first day at Roxbury when it was cold and icy and it was a little awkward and kids weren't really knowing each other and they were doing like the awkward get to know you phase versus the last day on the playground when kids were dancing and giggling and it was just really wonderful to have that experience with folks. Next please, thank you. Um, the other um, main or more formal youth adult partnership that we had this year is some student-led professional development opportunities. So during our half days, um, students facilitated five professional development um, sessions really based around community and restorative practice and how we leverage um, RP to create more community. Um, the first two were really focused on building a really strong sense of community wellness and digging into how does communication with teachers, between teachers, with students, between students, um, and what kind of communication we need to create a community that is well. Um, and the second one was really around collaborative decision making and why that's important for a solid community um, and what that looks like um, in a setting. Then our third one was digging into how do we create a, be a beloved community. We had a, a little bit bigger chunk of time for this one um, because it was on one of our in-service days um, and just really thinking about the overarching view of restorative practices, what does that look like, and really digging into this idea of doing with rather than for or to and what that looks like on um, a classroom level practice. And then one of the ones I was most excited about personally, I thought they did a great job designing this, was they created six um, micro labs for one of our half day releases um, where teachers got to choose how they wanted to engage that day. The first one was interrupting bias and microaggressions. Um, second one was increasing engagement by understanding brain science, building a classroom community, um, they had one about restorative communication, um, really getting back and diving a little bit deeper into communication and wellness and how those two are inherently linked. Um, one about um, exploring a restorative mindset, so rather than thinking about restorative practices as like um, specific strategies that you leverage, really think about how that becomes an innately who you are as an educator and how that guides your practice. Again, beautiful job talking about this. Um, and then the last one on that day was deepening understanding of the benefits of doing with rather than for to. Then our last one we just had this Friday um, was thinking about giving teachers the time and space to um, intentionally 
plan out um, how to close learning communities, right? And having students really think about and pair and partner with folks around what that looks like and how to support some students through a pretty big time of transition and excitement and nerves and more excitement. Um, you know, this time of year can be up and down for a lot of folks. So how do we actually support students through that and intentionally say goodbye at the end of a year? We just had this great quote by a teacher talking about how amazing they were doing, um, which was really wonderful, right? The first time, the first PD, you know, folks were standing up in front of the theater, in front of 70 odd of their own educators, um, which was just really wonderful to see. Next, please. Um, this was additional training. I threw this in not because it was student-led or student partnership, but I think it's really foundational work that we have to do as um, a community of educators to really increase our ability to form partnerships. So forgive me, I hope this is okay. But you know, I really come from the lens as the SEL person that strong SEL skills lead to a really strong community and that leverages our ability to create authentic partnerships with students. Um, so Joelle came in five times also during those early release days, talked about teacher wellness, building community, um, talked about how do we teach SEL skills, how do we embed that in our instruction. Um, and also talked um, about asset-based language and really talked specifically about how we talk about kids and how we talk about other people impacts our sense of belonging, impacts our identity and who we are, um, and how do we you know, talk about students in a way that's beneficial to adults and also very respectful uh, and really asset-based. Um, then collaborative problem solving, you may have seen on Libby's blog if you've been looking. Um, I'm really excited about this work. Our SEL professionals um, are doing this work. We did the tier one training um, and this collaborative problem solving um, is really like Ross Green's brainchild. Some of you may be familiar with it, but it essentially gives teachers um, the framework and the tools to go into a, a hard conversation with a student who is having some sort of behavior challenge, behavior response, um, and get really at the root of the problem and really frame this as a problem that we're up against together. So how do we work on this together to move forward? Um, and I just think it fits so smoothly into this idea of doing with and not for to. Um, so, you know, I think for us to move forward in youth adult partnerships, these just felt really foundational pieces for the adults in the building to do. So I wanted to include those. Next, please. Did you say Ross Green? Yeah. Um, MRPS Pi and some community partners um, have offered to do a bystander intervention. Last Friday, they came in for a full day of training and we had 18 students who worked with them all day um, and learned how to be a bystander, what that means, and also develop curriculum so that next year they'll be going into the elementary schools and actually teaching how do we um, be a bystander, how do we safely interrupt um, things and incidents when it happen, um, and really what does that look like. So I'm really excited about that work for next year. We're also gonna, of course, continue our partnership with Up For Learning, because they've been really foundational um, to us, both with the retreats, the um, RBS, um, MSMS, UES retreat, and just that like really weekly leveraging of student voice on how do we embed that into our system. Next, please. Um, and then last but not least, this is a very preview of Panorama. We'll talk about Panorama in much more depth in the future. Um, but one of the things that I'm really excited about with Panorama is it's a tool and a platform that we can use to survey students and get their, um, you know, their view and perspective of 
belonging climate and how they were doing on SEL skills. So my hope and real excitement about this is it's gonna give us the data rather than um, folks and groups have to spend their time coming up with surveys and analyzing the data. We'll just have that data in the future um, and we'll be able to make really concrete data-based goals um, and see how our work is impacting student perspective based on how students are reporting them to us. So excited about that. That's all I have for you. Thank you, Jess. Um, questions for Jess? Just let Beth know your... I, I just want to observe, I, I've heard from community members with respect to the combining the fourth graders and including the middle school kids and there was I think, a pen pal aspect of that and parents were thrilled. They thought it was excellent. So I'm really grateful. That's been a big sort of concern, I think, for all of us. It's come up a number of times how to sort of bring those communities together. And um, it sounds like that's a, a really great structure that you have for, for combining and bringing the middle school kids to. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I'm really excited about it. And it certainly was a group of administrators, not just me, that made it happen. Um, but yeah, we've gotten great feedback, but thank you for sharing that. And it's continuing, just so everyone knows. <laughs> uh, Emma? Oh, sorry. I, know. And, um, I just had a question. Thank you so much. And it, like this presentation and the last presentation, it's just like really a nice way to sort of end out the school year. And, yeah and get some really positive um, feedback from, you know, boots on the ground, what's happening in the schools. So I really appreciate it. It's great, great work that you're up to. Um, I'm wondering about sort of the, uh, the partnership with Up For Learning and where that stands from a budgetary standpoint. Like, was it funded through ESSER funding? And excuse my ignorance, but. No, no, that's okay. Um, and will it, how many year, more years will it continue? Or is it something that needs to be like put into the budget again? Yeah, so it was funded through the MAC grant, um, which is sort of a wellness grant aimed at creating safety and belonging and increasing health of students. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I think that it is something that we have to reapply for every year. I think that there are a lot of competing priorities for that money as well. Do you know how much the grant is for? Um, not off the top of my head, but I did know okay. a few weeks ago. Any other questions? Um, yeah. I also just wanted to say thank you, first of all, because this is like really incredible progress, I think. Um, when we had the school safety committee that we did a few years ago, a a lot of these things were things that people were asking for and things that in the research that we did indicated that they make a huge difference in a school community for the things that, like interrupting the, the things that are become, take, become real challenges for students like punitive discipline or even to the um, extent of like the school to prison pipeline. This is the kind of work that, that keeps us, keeps us as a community and keeps individual kids who are struggling from going down paths like that. Okay. And so I just think that this is like amazing that we have co such a foundation happening now. And so thank you to you and then for everyone else who's doing this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not it's really a team, yes, yes, thank you. Oh. Um, I really, I just wanted to say that. And then I also wanted to ask from your perspective, like this is a, big effort. This is a lot of work. What tells us when it's like making the impact that we want it to make? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to talk too much in detail about Panorama, but that is something that'll be a pretty strong tool. It does have surveys that are research-based that go out to students on a regular basis that talk about their perspectives in climate in belonging and can help track their SEL skills um, and how they change over time. Um, so I'm, I think that that is going to really help us figure out what is the impact that this is happening. Um, because while anecdotes and wonderful emails from parents and feedback is fantastic and keep it coming, love it, thank you. Um, also, right, we wanna know that this is doing the real work and that we're 
interrupting the school to prison pipeline and keeping kids in our district and wrapping them even when they're having a hard time. Yeah. So we would be looking at information from students to know what difference this is making. That's very helpful. And then this also has a big impact on someone's ability to learn, right? The how connected they feel to their classmates and to their school community. And we heard it from these three students who were yeah. here presenting earlier today, just like how important it is for them to have that class where they all feel like it's a almost like a home base for them. Is there anything in the academic um, measurement that would help us that we should that we could look at to see this um, this work that we're doing on the social emotional learning side is having some sort of impact on academics or is there not a way to connect those two through the data yeah I mean I think that would be a great thing for Mike and I to continue to talk about mm -hmm. um, and we know the research says that when students have higher level of SEL skills they can perform higher academically right mm -hmm. so I think the assumption would be that we would see it in academic data too okay but that's my answer for now <laughs> yeah thank you that's a great question yeah other questions for Jess? I'll just add the resounding appreciation for this work. It's very dynamic and it's very complex just listening to the sustainability program and like what a teacher has to, you know, all the plates that are spinning and then to be managing all these outside partnerships and really empowering students in these really meaningful ways that they're getting skills that will actually translate into real world, you know, workplace experiences, community kinds of experiences. It's just so inspiring. Um, and it, it certainly makes me think about how it's changing students' perceptions about what school should be and what school should feel like for them. And I mean, um, teachers too. And teachers too, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, like uh, the teacher was saying, it's pretty scary up there some days. It can be really isolating. Yeah. And to feel that you are now partnering, you know, with students in the work of learning just feels like, like this is where we should be going in education. And so I just really appreciate all of the time and energy and passion going in. It's very collaborative work. It's very dynamic. It's not, it's not neat and clean canned, you know, curriculum. So thank you yeah. <laughs> to all of you. Um, and yeah, that was just like a question that I had uh, for our students is, you know, is this changing your perception of your role as a, as a learner, as a student? You know, is this changing your expectations of what school should be and should look like? Is it changing, you know, what you expect your relationship with your, with your teachers to be? So um, be interesting to hear, you know, candid student responses to those yeah. things. But um, it's, yeah, it's just really, really, really exciting work. So thank you for getting our kids out into the community and having real experiences. It makes them want to come to school. So yes, yes. yeah, that's the important thing. Yeah. yeah, I will extend that thank yes. you to a lot of people as well. Oh, and then, sorry, just one last thing, just to echo what Rhett was saying too about um, the RVS, UES, MSMS, Trifecta, and folks coming together. You know, I know that was actually like a part of the merger agreement that I think, you know, the original writers of the merger doctrine, you know, had written in specifically about, you know, that there was kind of this um, missing piece around transition both for UES students, you know, and now we have this new RDS component coming in and it just feels like that's really happening now in a very real way and it's being really leveraged. So thank you for getting that train on the track too. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah, quickly. Um, yeah, I could continue to shower praise. Um, it's amazing the work that you and others are doing. Um, but I'm curious for my own personal um, learning. Um, I do a lot of this type of work that you're describing, but with college um, age children, uh, students, adults, whatever you want to call them. Um, <laughs> sometimes they're all three. Um, the the student-led trainings, um, it, that, that's absolutely amazing, and I love it. I'm curious the how you select, how you engage the students in that. Um, is it the same students repeatedly? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious of that, that component. And then it, it seems, at least based on the quotes that you presented, um, that it's valued by the teachers. But I'm also I'm curious to get a little deeper understanding of, of how, the, how the, you feel the teachers are, um, are um, 
yeah, valuing that. Yeah, I think for your first question, there's been some variation around who's presenting and who's helping to facilitate and design those PD sessions. Um, I will say they tend to be students who are already involved in the Up for Learning um, groups that happen. So that is certainly, as we were talking about, just getting a wider representation, that it's certainly a grow area, I would say. You know, there has been variety, and I think that we have work to do around that. Um, I think teachers are really appreciative of the student-led stuff, um, and I think that there's always this tug between wanting to invite students in and doing that work with students and like being able to like be a human, you know, and be a teacher and be a human. Um, and so I think that there's always going to be that tension when we have youth adult partnerships, and I think that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's a great question. Other questions? I also want to echo the sentiment of just, you know, the, it's been great to uh, you know, see this work and get multiple presentations and see put good systems in place. And I know that you know, the whole district is benefiting. So it's been a, it's been a great year and it's, it's been a great position. It's great to have you on board and I really appreciate all the, all the work and the progress and the trajectory of the progress. Thank you. Is it, um, can I go now? Is that okay? You go now. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just looking to see. Now I have to stick around. Oh. Yeah, no, I, was, I was just looking to see if Beth was with us for the. Um, so I believe Beth contacted me and said she is ready. So um, I'll just let her know that we're ready. And then I think we'll just go to a breakout room, right? Yeah. Can we do it on a computer? Mm -hmm. or is that probably the best? Mm -hmm. And we should go to room 126? Yeah. Um, I need her to be in the meeting, I think, I know. before I create the breakout room. Or maybe Anna has to create it and send me and Beth to the... No. I might be able to, though. Oh, she, Beth she, is here. Okay, cool. Yeah. Hi, Beth. Welcome. Oh, here we go. She already went. She went to the break. So now, okay. bless you. I gave. Um, yeah. Now, oh, <laughs> she can't see me. Yeah. Hi. All right, so we Hi can Beth. go to room 126. Hold, please. We're all going to move to another room. Yes. Be right back. Yeah, and we are, so we're going, oh, we need a motion to go into executive session. Um, and just, we are, we do have some business after the executive session, so. So we will be coming back. Yeah, we'll try to make it um, not too long, and I know that Beth is under the weather, so um, we'll try to make an open for her, too. Um, will Mary and Zach be joining us in this executive session? Uh, absolutely. Uh, sure. So I move we enter executive session for reasons of personnel. For the, oh, the language the for the purpose of conducting an exit interview with Roxbury Village School Principal Beth Kellogg. I have a second. I'll say a second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. We will be back soon. Yes. All right. So it looks like we are all here. Um, policy monitored. We have two policy monitoring reports to approve. Um, Policy C3, transportation, and policy D5, animal dissection. Do I have a motion to approve the policy monitor reports? I move to approve the two policy monitor reports. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nick. And then we have the uh, first reading of two policies, one of which you just got. Um, but again, we can keep reading these until we're comfortable. So let's just keep that as a first read. Um, I don't know if Emma or Scott or right, you had one of these two. Want I'd like to give, give a little any context. context. Yeah. Um, 
So first of all, as a as the policy in the policy committee, we decided to move these two policies forward for a first read a little bit earlier than we normally would have. Um, in the past, we've sort of waited until we feel pretty solid in our first draft um, to move it forward to a first read. But what we notice is happening with the timing of the meetings, so the timing of when our policies go for first read and then when we meet as a policy committee to um, address the comments that were made in this meeting and then put those into action and, and revise the policy and then bring it back for a second read. The timing is just so, it takes so long to move through that process that we felt like it might be better just to like move it into first read, get initial feedback, and then it's still, still the process will take a while. But, <laughs> we, but instead of waiting until we felt like super confident in the first draft of these policies. So we're sending you a couple of drafts. Um, I, I'll let, I'll give Rhett the floor on title, the E1 um, policy. These are both re newly required or relatively new required policies but by the Vermont School Boards Association. So we don't have a choice. We need to adopt, uh, adopt them. And typically when we have a required policy from the VSBA, we don't do a lot of editing as per advisement from our legal staff. So, um, you know, we don't usually change much of them. The thing that's interesting about this uh, E1 is that there were lots of sections that were highlighted by the VSBA for us to uh, fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the concept being that we hold um, uh, a process by which families that interact with Title I in our district are able to provide feedback on what those filled in blank spaces look like. Um, so we know that we, need to do something there with um which probably might not even happen until fall i'm not sure exactly we, part of this first read was supposed to get libby's feedback but she's not here so um so i'll hand it over to rat for e1 he was the one that worked on the drafting do do we i mean this is a lot to literally read i don't think we should i yeah, think we yeah. should kind of give an overview of yes. what we did so yeah so um, you know, down to page seven, um, it be, it turns into policy adoption. That's where we stopped making edits. So it seemed like um, that would be where it becomes procedure, which would be where it's on the administrative teams at the different schools who are Title I schools. Um, RBS, <coughs> MSMS, and MHS are all Title I schools. UAS is not. Um, so, but I don't know if the um, the school board association, I mean, I don't know that you, it seems like good practice, right? All of this community reach out seems like a, like positive stuff. So I don't know that we would want to not include UES or whether we even have the capacity to include a school that's not a Title I school. Um, but, um, that's kind of why we wanted to bring it to the greater board because this is a, what this is about is a lot of community outreach, um, which I think we do. It provides a framework that will potentially allow us to sort of consolidate our efforts under this framework, um, if that's sort of a good way to go. Um, and then at the, at the school level, I don't know what authority the board has to dictate what strategies the schools are going to take <clears throat> on an individual basis. That's the main reason we wanted to bring it forward because we have come to a stop and we need, we need to communicate with administrative administrators. Um, because at this point, below page seven, you're talking about getting more and more focused uh, and that in terms of like this school is going to do this thing. Um, and that felt like further than certainly we wanted to go as a policy committee without greater input. I will also add quickly that um, the, bold, the text that's in bold starting on page three, any section that's sort of bullet pointed and in bold, we borrowed language from another school district that had already adopted this policy to give us an idea of the types of things that schools are, are putting into these fills, fill in the blank sections. 
Yeah. One other piece for context. Um, we currently have this policy. This is this would be an update. So it's, we're not creating a new policy. We're we're updating it based on the guidelines from the school boards association. Yeah, like new laws have been enacted that have made different requirements, and so the, our old policy is really different from this one. It's two pages. What kind of feedback would be helpful to you all? I mean, I think it's around how do we uh, how do we gather community input on this on um, the policy. Right. Yeah, and what like, should what be written in this policy? Like, what do you uh -huh. imagine it would be? How you know? And I think. Um, you know, we probably need Libby to weigh in on that too. But mm -hmm. if anyone has any ideas of, of like how would we capture feedback and, and um, create a process by which Title One, you know, families can be involved in creating the language of this policy, <laughs> I think that's the main feedback, right, Brett? What do you? Yeah, I mean. Um this it, on page two, it's highlighted MRPS will develop with, with parents and family members of participating students a written and pa parent family engagement policy. So that was sort of one of our questions. How many readings can you have before we start to bring in to have intentional meetings with families so that they can contribute their input to what this policy looks like? And, is, and then at that point, do you adopt the policy? Or do you do it in reverse and sort of create a policy that's supposed to have parent and family engagement and then have it just revise it? I, don't, I just don't quite understand what comes first there. Yeah, that's kind of the question that, that I understand. It's the chicken or the egg, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, the policy, which we already have, is outdated. So we need to update the policy and the guide, the, the model policy has language in it that says that it's a participatory process. So do we like engage in that participatory process in the process of updating it with a currently outdated policy on the books? Or do we get a better, but still not quite perfect policy on the books that says we're going to be participatory when we haven't been? And then with the hopes that we are participatory going forward, <laughs> That's the dilemma that we yeah. find ourselves and, in. And, and I think we have been, you know? I mean, I think we've done all, we, 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 and I think the schools, that's the other piece is like, what is, what, what, what sticks, sits with us and, and how will that come out of our retreats this summer when we're talking about our engagement strategies and formalizing them so that we can repeat them? And then what is not in our hands. That's really up to administrators that need to establish relationships with families uh, of children in those schools, of students in those schools. Have you checked in with Pietro yet on this question? No. I can understand the confusion. Because as I was reading this, I was um, also confused. I couldn't tell if in some places perhaps the word policy actually should have been plan, like a community engagement plan at the school level. Like it's kind of what you were just saying, yeah. Red. Is this anyway, I'm I'm just agreeing with you, so I'm not gonna really repeat what you all said. That said, to answer the question you've put before us, my vote, uh, no, we're not really voting, but my two cents would be, I think it would make sense to conduct a sh short but meaningful process to get input from families that would inform this policy rather than put this policy in place and then start engaging families. So that's how I would, that's how I would resolve the chicken and egg conundrum that we find ourselves in but I also understand it's confusing. I agree with that. I mean, I think the way that the policy is written, it would be sort of a violation of the spirit of the policy if we just move forward and adopted it without having a process. Yeah. How many reads does a policy need to? As many as we want. But at least three. three. At least three, yeah. but we can go more than that. So could it not be that in the process of going through those reads, we have the 
engagement with the community. So it's not a one yeah. before the other. Rather, we're building and updating this outdated policy with the engagement of those families yeah, whom and the policy affects. I think we're going to try to invite them in because, I mean, like, Theoretically, it's out there for anyone to come in and, and talk about it. But yeah. I th but yeah, I don't we would think need to be more yeah. explicit. I don't think there's a level yeah. of paying attention. I think too, like our knowledge as individual board members of Title I and how it is implemented in the schools and how families interact with it is so limited mm -hmm. that it does feel like it would be more appropriate for administrators or somebody else to be running that process or at least be a part of the process. So I think we need to. Um, Probably, so I think reaching out to Pietro is a good idea just to answer the initial question of, you know, the timing of the engagement and then also reaching out to Libby and others on the admin team to see uh, what type of process they would envision and what them sort of like lead. Yeah, we and we don't necessarily have to have this go to a second read at the very next board meeting, too. Right. You could say, yeah. wait until you've yeah. gotten some family engagement before it comes for a second read. Yeah. Or we could just have it go. Because, I mean, the As thing is, like, I mean, like, technically, if it's on there for a read, it's, it keeps it on the agenda and people come and speak to it. Ah, I see. And we can just say yeah. there are no updates. Yeah. <laughs> or or I, I guess what, as I was envisioning it in my head, and maybe didn't articulate it, it was, is the read and the engagement are at the same time. So is that possible to have? Yeah, like, definitely. Because yeah, we can each with read, read we, can take, we can take input and we revise it um, and get to the point where you feel we've had enough community engagement as a process of the, of the reads. Um, and again, we can. Yeah, we need three, but, but we can have more than three. So, um, Scott, are you imagining then that that would that the family engagement would happen at a board meeting, which is where the reads, where the reading happens? I imagine that some in, mm -hmm. um, engagement can occur at the time of a board meeting, mm -hmm. but that not every family is going to be exactly. able to right. engage at that time. And right. so there may be multiple modes of engaging. Yeah. And One of which being during a board meeting, during a read. Another might be, you know, at 12 o'clock on a Tuesday. And we also have to think about timing. I mean, people are, I mean, we have a few weeks left of school. Uh, then people are going to switch into summer mode. Is this, you know, is, is this the best time to engage the community? Um, or will people be a little more focused come late August, or early September? Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm wondering if we can have a plan for the end of, you know, have a plan to engage the community end of August and, you know, put the plan in motion through September and sometime end of September, you know, October or whatever, a couple of community engagement efforts um, that are really focused on this policy, essentially before budget season. I'll just offer that part of the equity audit is going to be intentional focus groups with different sectors of our community, um, perhaps. It, they And those are going to happen in starting in August into the fall. So perhaps we could inc like integrate these two things, which would be, I think, better for the families than asking them to come to two different meetings to talk yeah. about things that are going on broadly in the district around engagement. So yeah, anyway, certainly could dovetail. I think we, it would just be a matter of asking the um, firm that's doing the equity audit to incorporate a couple more questions probably into their focus groups. Yep. I don't know. It's worth yeah. asking. It's worth they're finding out. They're not necessarily out. unrelated either, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. About how we're capturing like the voice and opinions of our Exactly. Um, community at large. So yeah, yeah, I think figuring Doesn't it out. Doesn't feel disconnected. Yeah, and I think yeah, it's a, I think that's a great idea. And then also, you know, maybe doing some sort of survey that we can have all the the principals send out, mm -hmm. um, and creating like a little spot on our website for survey and feedback too. They could, you know, either send out like a district wide survey, mm -hmm. and then just have it be a kind of permanent link on the website at least for a few weeks where people can go to and. And is that copacetic for you all in terms of like timing with the SBA if it's a required policy? Like, does that 
or is there any time? Okay. I don't think there usually with these required policies. I don't think there's like a date attached to uh -huh. like when you have to. Yeah. But it's just sort of best. Practice. And I don't think it's sure. like an emergency time. emergency required right. policy. Like if we don't have it, we're yeah. Like and we're working in earnest. Yeah. Oh, we do have. Yeah. We do have. It's just updated. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> Okay. Do you I want to move on to the next one. I just have one other yeah. um, overall <laughs> piece of feedback, which is that it's very hard to read and it feels repetitive in places. And especially if we're thinking about non board members and non administrators reading this and wrapping their heads around it, i.e., caregivers and m other members of our community, it seems like either we need some sort of like explainer or summary or something or we have to it's there's got to be some way to streamline what it is we're trying to there was an idea communicate. that exploded in the policy committee about a year ago that is kind of fu on the future work <laughs> uh, list um, that was like on our policy page where we have all of our policies listed there could be like a layman sort of like explanation of what the policy is We've been trying to do that with the statements of intent. Yeah, a little yeah. Bit. We're, in, we're including a statement of intent in each policy. With, with these required policies, especially ones that are so bound to law, um, we've sort of been advised to not do a lot. So I think in that case, it could be a separate document that lives, but it can be linked um, even at the bottom of the policy to sort of explain yeah. the policy in a little bit more approachable terms. Yeah. One more quick thing to to address what you were just saying, Mia. There are there are sections in here where it specifically spells out the parent engagement piece, yeah. but it's not the entire policy itself should be drafted. It's these these different components. Um, it starts on like page three, basically, and so and so yeah. I don't see it as a here's the policy. Let's let's build it together. More, more along the lines of the, the details in those bullet points that we borrowed from wherever, Missisquoi Valley. Um, that's the piece where I think getting um, true engagement is going to be important. Like starting with part one, general requirements and expectations? Is that what you're, is that the part? It's those bold and bold <coughs> bullet points that are throughout the document that start on page three. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think part of it is to be specific, but it does read repetitive. Yeah. And, but I think for a lot of different engagement points, we want a lot of the same things, too. Ready to move on to the, the next one? Which is... Yeah, sorry, I'm just um, taking... C-13. So C13, I apologize that you didn't have access to that. Um, I changed the permissions for the whole folder so that in the future, I hope that it won't be a problem. Um, so again, this is a required policy. Uh, it's tied to law. Um, we did uh, actually um, another iteration of the policy committee when Ryan and Bridget were part of it. We had been working on this before they left. And so this statement of intent was written in conjunction with those two board members. Mm -hmm. um, and so we didn't have to do a lot of work on that. We didn't end up changing, I think, maybe anything once it says policy and then below that. Um, All of that is the required. Correct. And so the statement of intent uh, is that effort to uh, make the policy language a little more approachable and for people, you know, maybe students who are reading it, or families or caregivers who are reading it, or community members, um, that they have that sort of introduction piece and, and make, the, make the rest of the policy a little more approachable. Um, we also want to center it in the values of the district and make sure that we, we lead with the values, like why are we adopting a policy like this? And so we, had, we did change some of the language according to that. and. Um, and we also have asked the equity committee to take a look at this policy and see if they might have a sentence or two to add um, to frame this policy in equity. 
questions on the. Uh, the only thing I had a question about was, but I guess you already answered it because it was already it was cut and paste. Um, is the definition for homelessness um, section B? It lists a trailer park, which I feel like the common use of that is like a a mobile home. Mm -hmm. Maybe they mean like a trailer, like <coughs> like you pull in behind a car, but it just seemed weird to see a trailer park in there. Right, so that was a question that arose um, back when we had the legal mind of Bridget on the, on the policy committee. And we were able to sort of, uh, we, we ended up talking to the SBA about it. Um, and and then we did a little bit of work in the last policy committee too to, do, to look up um, definitions and stuff. And so that was a question that arose, like we didn't want, you know, basically the, the short answer is that that term is more about an RV type right. of park where it's very temporary living yeah. and not mm. somebody who's living, you know, in a in a, in warm, a modular home. Or yeah, yeah, or or something that has a foundation. That's right. And so they're planning to live there year round and right. it's insulated and has heat. Okay. But we decided to keep the language as they wrote it because of Pietro's suggestion not to change language on these legally bound policies. Would it be possible to put an asterisk and then at the bottom say, for these purposes, this is the definition of trailer park? Yeah, I mean, the, so the definitions If we are, can't change the words. Um, I don't know if you guys can see the comments. Can you see? Uh, I can see your comments. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, the definitions are linked, but we could, you know, they're, they're in the law. Yep. The other thing is if you, at the top, oh. number one, it, a homeless student means lacking fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, which could include. So if you're living in a modular home with a foundation and that is your fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, then you're not, under this policy, considered homeless. So I feel like with, there's so many definitions in here that I'm not sure we need to pull that one out since they're all, they all can be found, all of the definitions can be found if you click out to the, to the statute. Yeah, and also there's kind of a, I mean, in some ways we want to be, the flexibility to be a little overbroad. I mean, right. We don't want to, you know, stigmatize anything, but we also don't want someone who is in an inadequate living situation yeah. to be excluded from this because we have a cramped up edition of mm -hmm. the term. Any further questions on C13? I think in particular, if you wanted to give a closer read to the statement of intent, and then at the next reading, if you have uh, feedback on how that could be revised, that would be great. And we're hoping to have a couple sentences from that committee in there by the next week, or maybe the third week, depending on meeting schedules. Thank you for doing the policy work. Yeah. Great. Um, yes. No, thank you. Thank you, Emma, uh, Scott, and Rep for giving the overviews. Um, the motion to adjourn is next. The uh, motion. So moved. Um, second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And again, Let's do this. thank you, Zach and Merritt, for your fearless service uh, and good luck with graduation. We will be seeing you in, in just a